Welcome back to another impactful night of the Impact Education Leadership. This is episode 176. Tonight's panelist, tonight's guest is Carl Berry. Carl Berry, please say hello to the people, sir. Hello, everyone. How you feeling? Wonderful, wonderful. Well, tonight's topic is redirecting aggression and teaching confidence. There is so much going on right now, we can't even talk about it. Whether it's political, whether it's economical, whether it's geographical, where people are building, where people are buying land, real estate, or even social, how people are talking to one another these days, and what methods of communication that they're using. And that thing called AI is on an all new high. And so with this, with these types of I would say situations going on, sometimes it can be hard for us to manage our social skills and we can let aggression take the best of us. Before we get started into this topic for the night, Mr. Carl Berry, what was the first thought that came to your mind when you got the topic for the night, sir? Frankly, I I had to look at as I evaluated the difference between men and women, was I coming across prejudicial or sexist? Or was there some science and some behavioral uh, activities and traits behind the difference in the way uh, the pandemic affected and treated people? And so I actually uh, did something different. I studied on it rather than to rely on my own understanding and my own opinion. And so it was very insightful and gave me some new ideas and insights that would help me in my own life as well as those around me. Are are men more, do men show more aggression than women do? Or is it at the same level? And is it, is it healthy for men to, or women, to show that aggression? What's your thoughts? Oh, this is going to be so good. What's, what's your thoughts? What's your thoughts? You need time to chew on that? <laughs> well, first of all, there's a difference between distrust and discomfort. And I think that's the, the root cause that we have to reflect on as we analyze our response to certain uh, criteria. And so I think men uh, have aggression that is almost on autopilot that they feel like they are required to have that aggression because it is the manly thing to do. You got to man up. Uh, The other end of that also is, is that uh, we're dealing with a fear because we know in behavioral med and modification, we know that it's easier to get angry than it is to be hurt. And so a lot of times the men's response, I think, was more driven by what's expected, uh, what they think is expected of a man than the true feelings and emotions that come out. Although when you look at the numbers and the studies, it appears that men actually were more anxious where women were more depressed. And I found that to be very enlightening as well. And the anxiety comes from the ridicule, the uh, fear, and the discovery or depression that comes from uh, people asking questions that uh, make you uh, think that you're thinking or feeling the wrong way. You know, this is this topic is going to just get so real tonight. I can already feel it. And, and the only way I can express the realness is just being real and telling my real story. My family, because I believe aggression is also tied into genetics. My, my family comes from a, especially my, my father's side of the family, comes from a very tra- traumatic, um, I would say, livelihood, uh, meaning that they saw a lot. They, they did a lot. There, there were a lot of my family members in and out of prison. A lot of my family members in and out of re- recovering uh, addiction places, whether it was, you name it, heroin, crack cocaine, alcohol, and, and all those stigmas. And it drove a lot of my family members to, to mental illness. 
and and this is something that has, has crept into the society not only in the United States but globally and, and it's infiltrated our, our way of life and, and I experienced this hands on my mom protected us my my siblings and I from them and a lot of times we didn't understand because you love your family this is your blood it's like I am you know I, I'm a family member I love my family I want to be around them I want them to be a part of my world but yet my mom was keeping us away from them and you know I, I would get upset I was like why we can't go spend that over you know this person's house I can't even say the name because I know they're listening to the podcast but but now later on in retrospect as I've gotten older and I've experienced more in life who knows how that would have changed the trajectory of where I'm at today had I had experienced those traumatic experiences like my cousins have you know can we bounce back are we resilient so you know genetics family members and aggression I, I think they're so so closely aligned and and you know what? what are, what's your thoughts on that Carberry I'm just talking what's what's your thoughts about genetics and aggression well certainly genetics plays a role um, frankly not being a scientist I don't know if that's your DNA or if that's the history of your family uh, and it also brings into play that the uh, younger generations appear to have been more effective due to the statistics than uh, those of the traditionally older baby boomer ages. So those that are 30 and under, 35 and under, trouble coming out of the pandemic uh, than those that were a little bit older. Uh, And I think a lot of that, a lot of that just comes from the uh, the family uh, comes from the history of the family comes from the history of the uh, all the way back frankly to, 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 to racism and a lot of that stuff because uh, we all know that we had a lot more uh, community when we were in deep segregation than we did when we were supposedly uh, desegregated desegregation took away uh, the black community, the black businesses, the, uh, the, the interactive community, the ability to be vulnerable. And we got to be more and more trying to prove the scuttlebutt that was being fed behind our back was a lie. And so the 60s was a very divisive line in our culture, particularly of people of color. Uh, what they did, you know, prior to the 60s, the 78% of the houses were still uh, two-parent homes. And uh, 20 years later, 18% of the families were single-parent, uh, uh, one-parent homes. Uh, so it, it makes a difference. Uh, I think also in the era in which you grew up and, and who you listen to. You know, I grew up listening to uh, a, a multiple a plethora of people. I listened to to Rap Brown and Stokely Carmichael and Malcolm X and Martin Luther King. And I actually had some pros and cons about all of them. So I think that, yes, that's DNA, but that's also just social uh, socialization and uh, the things that you learn to appreciate and to believe. And then you hit one of the biggest ones on the head, and that was the affiliation with church. Church has become... Uh, so unpopular pandemic took away uh, so much uh, attendance and so much uh, interactiveness within our church families uh, you know like you don't see Sunday night services anymore rarely do you see Wednesday night services anymore and so it's very important for us to look at the things that I think that impact us and changes that aggression changes the level of tolerance changes what we embrace and all of those things are, are byproducts I think of our surroundings as well you know that was so perfect and I, you know, I'm going to ask this question here for the panel why are the young people so angry 
why are we so angry? You talked about back in the 60s, back in the 50s, young people, they fought differently. They did not, I don't think, I wasn't around then, but I don't feel like they stumped somebody to the point where they had to be, you know, sent off in, in the ambulance because they were trying to murder another child. And I'm talking about fifth graders. I'm talking about sixth graders, seventh graders, eighth graders. The, the hearts of many have waxed, I would say, cold cold-hearted to the point of numbness and where is this coming from I, I know that's a that's a crazy question to ask you to unpack but where is this coming from why there are so many colloquialisms out there like the angry black woman or the, the angry black man how and why have those labels been put I'm a black man how have those labels been put on us who wants to take that first? And why have they been put on us? Who wants to take that first? Who would like to take that? It's all part of the deterioration of the morals of our society. As far as I'm concerned, that's a, a very contributing factor. They said that there is more nudity in better homes and gardens today than there was in Playboy at the turn of the century. Uh, and that's only like 20 years ago. And so it's there are things they say on TV now that would have not even been allowed 30, 40 years ago. And uh, what we do for entertainment is so accepting of violence. I mean, what do the video games, what are they doing most of the time? They're killing somebody, they're fighting somebody. And it, it has lowered our level of tolerance for those things that used to be considered uh, faux pas. Uh, things that used to be considered uh, uh, unwholesome are now considered to be, oh, that's just another way to live. And add to that, that division of society has turned into silos. And now everybody has a group and everybody has a lobby and everybody has a, uh, a, 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 a bone to pick. And, and by doing all of that, we end up becoming divided rather than uh, united. And, and we are unaware because we're only talking to people that talk and think like we do. And we all know that uh, when people die for lack of knowledge. And so awareness is a big key for us to be able to stay together. And uh, you may have heard me say this before, Brother uh, Joan, that uh, my favorite word is maybe. If I could just come back to an open-minded lifestyle that's driven by maybe, then I've got a chance to listen and uh, and reevaluate what I think is the truth. Because everything is subject to re revision these days, especially what I know about the truth. Oh, this is, listen, I'm telling you right now, you need to share this episode with a friend, a family member, uh, a student at a school. I want to go into how mental health uh, is affecting our, our school campuses, not only in Texas, but a, around the United States. A long, a long history of stigma around mental illness permeates every level of our society and culture. According to the CDC, most aspects of our lives, including our emotional, psychological, and social well-beings are impacted by our mental health, our mental wellness us trying to be our best selves. You or a loved one may even have received a mental health diagnosis at some point in your life. And so people with mental illness are nine times, I repeat, nine times more likely to be put in jail, to be arrested, to be incarcerated, and then hospitalized. Dr. Dr. Isaac Carrier, how you doing, sir? Thank you for being a part of this panel and how we, we talk we're talking about mental health we're talking about aggression we're talking about we didn't even mention suicide i don't know is this a pandemic or is it an endemic because um you know <clears throat> i think it's an endemic that was exacerbated by the pandemic um you know the the operative word 
in mental health is health, right? Because mental health isn't the same as uh, physical health. Um, physical health is, is, is easy to, to, to physically see. And it is uh, something that everybody goes through at, at some point in time, probably multiple times throughout your life. With mental uh, health and mental uh, you know, concerns, those are largely hidden, right? Um, that requires uh, an individual to, it, it, to, to speak out for assistance. And, and a lot of times, and especially in schools, they don't know how to do that. Um, school people, and I'm one of those people, aren't, I mean, I'm not trained to, uh, to necessarily recognize or know what to do when I do recognize uh, someone that may be in um, in, a, in a in a situation where they need they need help, uh, you know, psychological assistance. Um, I, I speak for my era. You know, those are things you just didn't speak up about, right? Uh, because if you if mental health at at that point in time meant you were crazy, and and folks weren't going, kids weren't going, I wasn't going to speak up if I was having you know those type of of issues, um, I think that the 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 pandemic um, has exacerbated that because you know kids spent a lot of time um, in isolation, um, so there was a desocialization of those of, of kids over the course of that time. Now you know uh, while a lot of kids did return to school in the fall of of twenty. Um, there were a greater number that did not, and 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 in some cases still still have not. Um, and, you know, I think that that we talk about school counselors and and things like that. But if you ever worked in a school, you know that school counselors don't really get to counsel. They do a lot of stuff, but counseling is probably the least of what they are able to do simply because of the task and the lack of time that are, you know, that they were required to do other things. Um, and even when they are able to intervene, um, and it's a good thing, but, but more often than not, we, we still have to reach out to outside agencies and, and for, you know, for support. And I think the, there is awareness that has increased. I think there are efforts in schools across the country to, um, you know, to address those concerns uh, with social emotional learning, uh, helping, you know, school staff be able to recognize, you know, the signs and, and, and have resources for which to pull a draw upon to provide the support that a student may need, a staff member may need, um, and and but it still feels as though it's it's in its infancy. This isn't just you know a you know. I think the the, the bigger thing is it 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 is um, becoming more prevalent, right? Um, and it's becoming a little more acceptable to speak up and speak out when you need assistance. Um, and that's a good thing. It's a good thing. Um, I think some of the pressures of of life in general uh really lead has led to um where we are um you know it 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 at some point i think back in the day it was different types of pressures um but it is not something that is easily identified and certainly even less easily addressed um because I think at this point now in time that uh, more 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 people are coming forth, um, yet there's still a stigma around that, um, and and sometimes the the initial reaction isn't the correct reaction, and it, and that just leads to greater problems. And so, um, but it is good to see that you know efforts are being made. Um, I, I think that we're going to have to continue to work to really, you know, really address what social emotional learning 
really looks like and entails. Um, it's a hot, it's a sexy topic now. It's a sexy phrase. Um, and it's, it's not met with uh, opposition. Um, it's quite the opposite. I think it's met with aggression, but not, maybe not from the right place, if if, if that makes sense. No, that makes um, that, that makes total sense. That, and, and let me let me just say this real quick for the people that don't know who they're listening to right now. You, you're listening to the Carberry, listen to Doctor Isaac Carrier. But let me tell you really quick. Let me go toward Doctor Isaac Carrier. Not only is he now, to, I'm talking about to me. Not only is he a premier school superintendent, and I'm speaking at. Okay, let me speak it. <laughs> he's also an, an author. <laughs> he's also an author now of a book entitled Culturally Responsive Educational Leader. And he's, a, he's an adjunct professor. This man has been in the educational game for, for decades. Okay, for decades. And when we talk about issues like this, I want to hear from somebody that, that has experience. I want to hear from a, a Carl Berry. I want to hear from a Dr. Isaac Carey. These are the people I want to hear about because aggression, what is aggression? It's, it's a chemical reaction. It's a buildup of chemicals in the brain. That's what it really is. Caused by stress. Caused by mm -hmm. the environment. Caused by pain. Caused by suffering. And this, this pain and suffering, is, it starts with fear. And it's either fight or flight. It's either I'm going to sit here and, and fight you off or I'm going to run. And now because you are going back and forth and vacillating back and forth. Now this, this is turned into aggression. It's turned to revenge. And if you add in the mix, you, you're in isolation as well. Who are you going to vent to? Carl Berry said something so apropos for the night. He said, back in the day, we had church. Yeah, and we were at church all day long. I'm talking about all doggone day. We had to go home, change clothes, go back to church. But what it really was, was building our social skills. We were around people. We couldn't act out too crazy because guess what? They knew our parents. They, we were spending the night over over their parents' houses. They were spending the hour, and it was like a huge. What it was was a huge village, and that's how we were raised during those times. But now, absolutely, you got PTSD, and it's so chronic. It's so it's it's really a chronic disease. It's almost like chronic a chronic a chronic homeless person where they you know it's generational. The mom was homeless. Now the daughter's homeless, or she's gonna eventually become homeless. And so let me let's talk about this. Let's talk about this. Let's talk about what are your thoughts from what Dr. Carey just said as far as how mental health is is affecting our, our school campuses today. What's your thoughts? Well, I think for me, it is a, a big difference between mental health and mental acuity, and. A lot of times, because of stigma, we don't want to even become aware of what the symptoms might be because it might affect me. And I, I say that particularly around our, our prison system and incarceration in general. Uh, people that don't have the mental acuity to speak up and stand up for themselves are easier to uh, herd and easier to feed uh, the for-profit prison system that we live in. Uh, it's easy to keep these people housed because they don't really know how uh, they, they, the people that recognize there's a problem take advantage of it. You know, we, we know that money's still the root of all evil, and most of the harmful things that go on in planet Earth, in my mind, are still driven by grief. Uh, we can go back history years and years and years ago. And what, what we see over and over again is people uh, getting on a horse, uh, riding across Europe into Asia, uh, supposedly carrying a message of hope, but they're actually robbing 
uh, the uh, the areas that they go into of their resources. And then we get into slavery, same thing. And it's not about uh, as much about moral evil. Even slavery and after slavery ended in the United States, it wasn't about evil intent. It was about money. The South lost the war. We had to figure out a way to keep people in jail and keep slavery alive, but give it a new name. And all of this kind of stuff, I think, is what's going on and what Doctor was talking about in our school system, because we've got to understand, uh, we've got a lady that's stressed out in the school system teaching now, uh, because she's gone through this pandemic, she's gone through the challenges of being at home with the kids and then having to come back and try to teach the kids and dealing with the criticism that's coming from the parents and that's coming from the administration level of the school system and then trying to teach the kids under mental stress of their own. And and now we're dealing with a a kid that is uh, granted pretty much uh, uh, unconditionally, uh, they don't care. A lot of the younger people don't care about what's supposedly right or wrong because that's just your opinion. And uh, opinions are, I think, too much and too uh, oversold today. Everybody's got a right to feel like they want to and do like they want to. So therefore, no holds barred. And therefore, we don't even have any general control over what's going on. It's hard to assess anything these days because everything's in different camps. So I I agree uh, with school kids. I got seven grandkids that live less than a mile from my house. And uh, I see uh, what goes on in their schools. I see what goes on in their minds. I see the apathy. And they usually fall into one of two camps. Not a lot of middle ground. I usually don't care and I hate everybody or I'm scared of everybody and I'm hurt. Uh, And and it's, it's either aggression or fear from my perspective. Okay, watch this. Watch this. Uh-huh. I'm about to throw you a curveball, Dr. Isaac Carrier and, and Mr. Carl Perry. Is incarceration the new or the modern word for slavery? Is that the buzzword? Who want to take that? Well, I don't know if it's a buzzword or not, but it, it is absolutely 100% uh, um, the new slavery. Um, and it's not new. It's been it's been around. Like like the good brother said, um, when when actual slavery slavery ended, it it really just morphed into something else. Um, you know, we we get uh, longer sentences for lesser crimes than anybody else. Um, it, it seems as though there's always uh, an, an, an effort to incarcerate. Um, and little effort goes into, um, you know, addressing problems such as, um, you know, mental health or uh, the mental acuity, to use um, my brother's term. And um, they want it to be that way. Um, but but absolutely, it, it is a it is a slavery type situation. Um, it, it is just, it is un, 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 unreal, unbelievable how uh, one person can commit a, a, a felonious crime, another person of another of a, of a different, I'll just put it out there, race, commits a felonious, the same felonious crime, but the the result is vastly different. Um, and. It, it, it just it just amazes me. Look, there's a there's a, a, a trial going on right now in, in Houston. Um and and this goes back to the late nineties, I think, is when we or early two thousands when this crime took place. It was you know, uh, a man that killed his wife or has been accused and charged and, and ultimately convicted of killing his wife and unborn child. Um, after some time you know, he was released and granted a new trial, um, ultimately just to be found guilty again. And the reason this comes to mind, not because just because it's in the news, I actually know this person. Um, we had, we played college football together. And, and if you had asked me back then, 
if he had, would ever have been uh, uh, someone that would commit this type of crime, I'd have, I would have laughed at you. But but here we are in in a in a in, and he's been free for quite some time, waiting a, a, a trial for sentencing. Um, I do believe that if if he were not the the person he is or, or was, um, this never would have happened. Yeah, I mean, how many how many accounts recently have we heard of folks been spending eighteen, twenty plus years, you know, uh, thirty years incarcerated for crimes they didn't even commit? And you know, so I I believe uh, that we are absolutely. Uh, you know, prisons are modern day slave camps. They've been like that since 1900s when the slaves were freed and they issued that movie, The Birth of a Nation, which was the resurgence of the Ku Klux Klan. And they started putting people in jail that you were free unless you had a criminal record. And they started hand, uh, uh, putting people in jail for jaywalking and vagrancy. You go to 1920, and from 1920 to 2020, if you look for drug uh, 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 arrest alone, you will find that 19% of all the drugs sold were sold by black people. Black people constituted 87% of the people in prison. And why was that? Well, that was because the people that were behind the manufacture and distribution uh, a lot of times were people of power. Again, the evil money greed situation. And the police knew they couldn't bust the DA's son-in-law because that would put his job in jeopardy. So we go get these guys over here, which is easier to get them, just like with the mental health, because they're a little more defenseless. They don't have the money to fight it. They don't have any clout. And we're going to leave these people over here alone because it's going to protect my own job security, my own livelihood. And now look at it. Uh, how much money and who's selling all the marijuana? How much money is coming in from that now? You know, and we still got people serving sentences for small quantities of, of marijuana. So it, it is definitely... A, a, a profitable system and it's definitely a system of slavery because they got them even if you're making license plates there's some value in license plates so yeah I agree with it, it uh, it's slavery and, and, and if, if I may I, I, I like to add because you brought up the, the, the subject of marijuana and you know there, there's a push to, to legalize marijuana here uh, in, in our corner of the country. Um, but it, it, it's also, um, we have a, a, an issue across the country with, with fentanyl. And people are dying in, in crazy record numbers as a result of, of that drug. Um, but I didn't see that, I've never seen any fervor, and certainly not the same fervor, in addressing that um, than that we see now, right? Um it is, it is, it is unbelievable how many people were incarcerated for small amounts of marijuana for long periods of time, and what they're doing now just to address this this fentanyl issue really is because who's dying from the fentanyl, um, and and where that is coming from. So, you know, it's. Uh, it's not something I've paid a whole lot of attention to uh, there because, you know, there's something large on, on, on our plates right now in education. And and that's that, that whole voucher situation. And I'm not going to get into it because I know that's not the topic of tonight. But I hope at some point down the line that we do address oh, that oh, because oh, I've got oh, to, Would you be on that? I got a lot to episode? say about that. Would you be on that episode? Uh, I, I will, yes, I will. Wh whatever I'm doing, I will make time to be part of that episode because, again, our children are are majorly at risk, um, and and it's happening and it's been happening right in front of our eyes, and nobody's doing anything about it. Um, and so, it's 
Yeah, it, 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 that's the topic of that, that that's making me really hot, really hot, uh, and something I definitely want to address. But back to what we are talking about, um, you know, I it, it's it's just amazing, um, and and Mr. Barry, uh, you know, the numbers, and, and and I appreciate you you coming with this. The, the statistics, right? Because uh, the numbers don't lie. The numbers just simply don't lie. How can we make up such a small percentage of the the world population, national population, yet the the largest percentage in incarceration? Um, and, and that's been a question that's been around for for years and years, and I don't know that it's ever really been answered. Uh, and even if it has been answered, nothing's been done about it. Well, listen, I got a question for both of you. But before I ask the question, let me just say this. Now, the podcast is, is has been, I just got the stats back last weekend. So they're saying that now the podcast is in 90 countries. And, and this is not for me to get kudos. I'm just saying it's helping people. What you guys are saying, what the panelists are saying, people are not only taking notes, they're living by your by what you're saying. Now what I'm saying, they're living by what you're saying. They're moving, they're making their moves by what you're saying. And so I got the report back. It said, all right, the podcast is in about 90 countries now in 25, and it, it said at least 2,500 cities across, across the world. We're talking global. And so I'm gonna ask this question because it's really a global question and I know we got the right people to answer it. And the question is this right here. And it sounds simple, but it's deep. It's deep. It's going to be a curveball. The question is, are, are black women really angry? Are black men really angry? Or is that just a stereotype? Talk about it. <clears throat> I believe it's both. Um, uh, uh, um, earlier, uh, Brother Carl said that, uh, and no, the question was you, that you asked, uh, Brother Drone was, um, is 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 the stigma or or, or uh, being an angry black man or an angry black woman is that a real thing? And the answer is yes, but it's also a cop out from those that don't want to engage in whatever the conversation is or addressing whatever the matter is. Um, I think we're on, on, on the one side, I think we're angry because we have a right to be angry. Um, you know, generations of suppression, generations of maltreatment. Um, and, and so, yeah, right. We, we, we have a right. Those folks have a right to be to be angry. Um, on the other side of that is um, a misunderstanding and a lack of desire to understand um, whatever point or what from whatever direction we're coming from. So it, 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 if, if we don't follow, if they don't follow, there are the, the, the unwritten rules of engagement, uh, then then the easiest way to dismiss someone who has an issue is to focus on how things are being said as opposed to what is being said. And, um, and then, and, and don't back off for of that. You know, he's just mad. He's just angry. And, 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 and of course, then you, you get into this whole, uh, false fear thing, right? Because now, he's an angry black man and, uh, and, and so I fear for my life. Um, anything to deflect getting at the root of whatever the issue is, um, part of it is cultural. We raise our voices. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, some of us have been, have been taught and, and have had that suppressed so that in certain situations, well, we we respond in a different way. But at the end of the day, that should not matter. 
what I'm, whatever my issue is, should be the focus of your listening, not how I'm saying what I'm saying. Um, and and so yeah, I think there's a there's a legitimate on both sides. Yes, we they are angry. We are angry. Um, but I also think that there's there's a, a definite uh, effort to dismiss the concerns, the the issues, the comments, the the thoughts and opinions based on how they are expressed. Um, and, and those those things in my mind are, are very real. Uh-oh. It's very important also to to look. I think at culture. Uh, because we mislabel culture all the time. I'm an elder in a, a multicultural church, and I was uh, when I came in, they had a philosophy: we're not black, white, or brown; we're Christian. But I told them, well, everybody don't like country and western. You know, your idea of Christian is to do it your way. But culture is much more than skin color or language. Culture is education, yep. social economic. Culture is a broad base. I I have to be light complexed. I dealt with cultural problems within my race all my life. The, the darker kids beat me up because I was white. The white kids beat me up because I was black. And the Mexicans didn't like me because they thought I was a Mexican couldn't speak Spanish. And so we, we've got to understand that. That's why I'm, I, I go back to my favorite word, maybe. You know, sometimes you're an angry black woman. Uh, when you say something and a white woman says the same thing and she's outspoken. It's all depending on your perception of the culture. And if you go back and look at everything from the perspective of maybe, it allows you to reevaluate everything you're looking at and everything that you're describing it and give it an honest, current evaluation of what you're looking at and who you're looking at. Absolutely. So at the, at, at the at the at the foundation of it all has to be a desire to do so, and 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 that is missing. That, that is missing because it, it maybe is the optimistic and, and and fair. You know, you 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 are if you can look at something using the term the idea of maybe, then there's a fighting chance that there will be a a a real uh, resolution solution answer. To whatever the issue is but if you're unwilling if a person is unwilling to do that and then it's going to always be you know whatever it is their perception is and and what they want and i failed uh to mention culture because you know that's exactly what it is it's it's a cultural thing um and and that's not easily defined to your point so uh but but but, you know, but 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 not to not to carry it though you 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 talking about Carol Dweck <laughs> okay you come on come on you, you ain't talking to, about what Dr. Carol Dweck you know growth mindsets you 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 on that growth, oh yeah yeah you on that growth mindset Elaine and, and you ain't have to mention culture because everything you said is a, is aligned to that let me let me really quick let me let me go to. Oh my God, we we're almost out of time. We're all we are out of time. But let me go. Let me go to Carl Berry real quick, because I want to ask him a real question. That's gonna be, I'm. Uh, uh, this question is gonna knock you into the popcorn section. Now let me tell you what the popcorn section is. When you're in the boxing ring or or a, a wrestling ring, okay, where the commentators are, are seated, that's right outside the ring. So if you get knocked outside that part, uh, that that's not even the, the popcorn section, right? But, but you knocked out that ring and you're going into the outer ring where the commentators are. But the popcorn section is, is all the way up there at the top where the people are coming into the arena uh, at the concession stand. This question <laughs> is going to knock you there, okay? And, but before I ask you the question, let me ask you, what you got going on currently, sir? Because I know it's a lot. Carver, what you got going on, sir? Well, I am working on Youth Summit, and we are unpacking mental health using a focus on stress because we believe that stress is definitely a precursor to mental health. Stress is something also that most people can admit and embrace 
and it, it almost ends up hinting to that person that, yeah, I might have a little stress, and that also lets them internally suggest that, and that might lead to and might be a, a sign of some mental health. You know, but it's, it's, it's like the uh, doctor said, it's, it's health and not uh, craziness. It's not schizophrenia and, and, and other serious problems. It's just the fact that the person has a, a problem with the mind. You've got to grant them the same love that you would tearfully grant a sick friend. They're just sickness. It's a sickness. It's an illness. And uh, I think that, for me, uh, mental health in the uh, the staying focused on mental health and the impact it has on our community as a whole is, is where I'm at. That's what I'm working with. And I believe that mental health means simply lack of sound judgment. Whenever you're dealing with youth summons, you, you're saving our sons. You're saving our daughters because that, that is the apex, I believe, of youth civic responsibilities and, and involvement and it I don't think it gets higher than that level a youth summits I, I just personally don't and so I applaud you on that endeavor sir we're going to be praying for you have the words speaking promoting it whatever you need let us know okay we stand behind you totally and with that being said let me let me ask you this question especially with you involved in youth summits Now this tore my heart out of my chest What am I going to tell you I'm, I'm an educator And I found out last week One of my I call them my babies I'm, I'm like Dr. Carrier I got that from Dr. Carrier The impartation These aren't my students These are my babies And I, I got word last week That one of my babies died And it was, it was a lot of rumors out there Some were saying well, in a nutshell, I'm just going to say this. There was a gun, and it was only him. The gun went off. He died. I'm not going to try to dig deep into that. I'm going to the, the funeral this weekend. I'm not going to ask questions. I'm just going to be there. That's it. And I, I saw this kid every day. So I saw him every day and I didn't see anything wrong with him. I didn't see anything on him. But he's gone. My question to you, how has this pandemic? Wow, I'm sorry. <clears throat> how has the impact of this pandemic affected mental health across genders? Meaning, are, are, are females reacting to this? And I'm talking about COVID-19. I'm talking about the isolation. That's what I'm, I'm referring to. Have our females um, show reacted differently than the males? Uh, and I'm talking about young people, too, because they're our future. What's your thoughts, sir? The study that I did on it said that the women were prone to depression and the men are more prone to anxiety. Uh, and that the younger they were, the more the division happened. And the, the reasoning that they said the women were more depressed is that the women is the primary care of children. And so uh, here you are, you're locked up in the house, uh, you're, you're working for home, uh, also, one of the reasons women were more depressed is that the economics and the job market was also more severely impacted by women 30 years of age or younger. And so when you, you make it a financial problem, you make it an emotional problem, you leave them at home with the kids, the kids are going to be kids and they're going to stress you. You're already stressed. And so in, instead of being anxious and a little bit concerned and a little bit worried, uh, you are actually depressed. It is a bummer. My life is not a good thing. And after I looked at it, because I, I told you earlier, Isaiah, I didn't think there was a difference. But there is a difference, and that difference becomes from 
uh, the social norms, the fact that uh, so many of our kids are being raised by single parents, the founders of them being women, uh, is why we have, I think, the disparity. That, that's what uh, I said, and I want to leave doctors some room to, to answer that, too, too. Wow. Dr. Kerry, what's your thoughts? Talk about it, please. Would you, uh, would you restate the question once one more for me, please? Absolutely. I asked, I want to say Dr. Barry, excuse me, because <laughs> that was so, that was so good, that was so good, that was so good. His response was so good. It was so apropos, as Buddy Thornton would say. How has the pandemic impacted mental health, especially in our schools, even with or even across the different gender differences? Meaning, how has it? How what effect has it had on our, our young girls versus our young boys? Um, you know, I think it. I, I think it's affected them uh, equally the same. That there is no difference uh, in in some of in a lot of the results we see. Right, they they are acting out a lot. Um, Unfortunately, you hear about the incidents of, of, of violence or fighting uh, in some schools, but it's actually happening in all schools. Um, and and girls are just as, in, in some cases, even more active in, 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 in that activity than even boys are. Um, um, you know, it, it, the, the whole thing was a stressful situation, not just isolation. You had people that, <clears throat> that that couldn't work, so, you know, but the bills kept coming. Um, you know, the the, the the lights had to stay on, food had to be on the table, so you got people that are stressed out behind that. Um, you couldn't go anywhere. You're locked up, and, and, and I mean, I, I remember it was just craziest, right? You, you know, you, you, you're in the house, and you felt like, I mean, this it, is, this is no lie. I felt like if I walked outside, I was going to get sick and die. You know, I had a really close, close fraternity brother that early on, uh, you know, passed away. We didn't get to see him. You know, one, one day we got a text message saying, hey, I'm not feeling good. I'm on quarantine. Uh, a few days later, the next text message was his wife saying that he was intubated in the hospital. Um, and we never gave him, a, you know, didn't get to give him a proper you know, uh, funeral service, uh, any of that. And, and so, you know, and people act as if the pandemic is over. It, it is. I mean, COVID is still around. It's going to be here. It's not going anywhere. Luckily, medical science has, has, uh, made some ground in, in helping to address that. I mean, I think the, obviously the, the mortality rate has greatly diminished, but, um, but even that, right? I mean, your kids lost loved ones, parents, uh, friends, siblings. And, you know, that is, that's real. Um, folks have lost jobs and, and, and maybe, uh, they may be working now, but the many aren't in the same capacity or at the same level that they have become accustomed to. Um, I mean, it, it just, I mean, I could go on and on about, the negative effects and the things that have that have uh, resulted um, post pandemic lockdown. Because I, I don't want to say that it's over. Because there are people that are still we don't even hear it on the news anymore. But it's still out there. <clears throat> it's still happening. Just not at the rate that it once was. <clears throat> and then you had false, you know, false information, lack of information. I remember having them, to, you know, speak with my. My uh, my daughters, one is is twenty one now, and the other one was sixteen. Well, where did they get their news? Because it's not it's not watching the the CBS evening news with law, uh, you know, with whomever that person is. Um, it's it's whatever is out there on social media. Um, and you know, my daughters didn't want to get the the vaccine because it was squarely rooted in their minds that they were going to not be able to have children later. Um, and so. I would think that that kids, since the question is about kids, uh, kids everywhere um, 
suffered in, in uh, or experienced things in, in that way. Uh, but having, you know, been working in schools for, for during that time as well, you know, I'd never seen girls fight <clears throat> or as angry and aggressive um, as I've seen over the past past couple of years. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that, that um, in, in, in hindsight, you know, we almost needed a, a, I don't know, a, a reintroduction into what what we knew was as normal life. That didn't happen. We went back to our quote unquote normal lives as if nothing had ever happened. And, and reality is great trauma to everybody had taken place. Um, and so there, there is no, it's, it's not a surprise to me that we're, you know, we we find ourselves um, where we are in a, in a, from a social standpoint. Um, and things, even in the financial standpoint, have, have not gotten better. I mean, you can sell a house, <clears throat> but interest rates being so high, you, you can't go buy another one uh, uh, at, at, a, at a reasonable you know, at a reasonable rate. So, I mean, everything's changed. You, you can't get a, um, a carton of eggs at a decent price. So, yeah, the, the world is different as a whole um, as a result of, of the pandemic, and, and that includes our children. Um, we, we tend to, because as adults, we tend to, to um, hear more about um, our adult issues but our kids, our babies are are, are suffering um, no no less than than we as adults are. Listen, we this has to be a part two. This was so rich. Uh, can, couldn't couldn't ask for anything more. All right, we we are definitely out of time. What are the takeaways for the night? Who wants to go first? What are the takeaways you want to leave the audience with? Who would like to go first? And, and we out of here. I'll, I'll go. I'll, I'll go first, and I'll be very, very brief. Um, a lot has happened. Um, you know, uh, efforts towards equity and and in and, and diversity, acceptance, all of that stuff has has, has happened during this time. Um, there's a lot of healing that still needs to take place, uh, not only from from grief, from death, but just you know how our world has changed um, and and continues to and. You know, we really, we really need to get back to um, to being uh, the brother and sister that we were charged to be by our Lord and Savior. And um, when when we, as more of us, make that turn and 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 go back in that direction, I think that's when things will ultimately get better. Um, and you know, until that time, we we all have to do our part, not only for ourselves, but for our fellow man, brother, and sister. Um, and and you know, there is there is hope, and we cannot afford cannot afford to lose that. Powerful. I think the two big the two biggest things for me. The first thing that the basketball the team does, whether they're little kids or they're pros, they go out and they line up and they shoot layups. And I think the first thing we need to make sure we do is maintain our fundamentals. And the fundamentals that were missing that caused the biggest problem in the mental health era of pandemic was lack of drinking water, lack of exercise, lack of vitamin D and sunshine and we were going from the office to the the recliner to the kitchen to bed and that caused our systems to break down and our health to go and my brother brought up my lord and savior jesus christ and the scripture says don't forsake the meeting of the brethren we got a pajama church out there now that they go into church online with their mimosas and in their pajamas and there's no fellowship like Isaiah said. You know, we need to continue and return to the basics. You know, when's the last time you ever seen a group of girls jumping rope? I mean, and, and doesn't sound like much, but that was exercise. 
And so if we exercise, if we drink water, if we eat better, if we do all of the fundamental things that we've been told for years that what we need to do, it will depreciate the mental challenges and the problems that we have. Impact of Educational Leadership Podcast. Facebook.